A very good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to a thematic session, Global Nutrition and Health, Focus on Nutraceuticals, Ayush, Ahar, and Superfoods. I would now like to invite Mr. Devakar on stage, please. He is the Chief Executive Officer, Technology Business Incubator of NutriHub, Nodal Officer for National Millet Mission, Policy Planning, and all issues related to economics of sorghum millets. So I kindly request you to start the session. and scientific credibility and in India. So, uh, applause. Lord, yes. The next panelist, Mr. Dilish Bhav Bajaj, founder and CEO of All Organics, Aesthetic Nutrition Project. Yes, and we have a distinguished uh, uh, global part panelist from this, for this session. Mr. Julie Adams, Vice President, Global Technology and Regulatory Office. <laughs> then, uh, last but not the least, uh, came on the way from Bangalore. Uh, please uh, have an applause, Mr. Amit Agrawal, CEO, <laughs> is the Director of Financial Remedies Private Limited. As you see, the distinguished pan panelists, we have uh, the senior most like Judy Adams and the youngest, Dirich Bajaj, and uh, the experienced Nirupama on <laughs> various sectors, and Amit Agarwal, who could bring in scientific in input. I think uh, it's a very well curated uh, panel for this, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we are going to benefit. So I'm just setting the rules. Uh, we have about eight minutes presentation for each of the panelists. Uh, I think we'll take the same uh, route uh, in the way they are sitting here. Uh, so the presentation, who, whoever is interested in making the presentation, I think they are most welcome. But if you are comfortable in just speaking extempore, that is also fine. But we would like to have uh, deeper insights. Uh, I think from West India, somebody is there, just uh, please uh, take the time into consideration. We will be having eight minutes presentation, maximum eight minutes presentation, followed by a couple of questions. Then the next speaker is uh, uh, remind us. So now I request uh, uh, Dr. Mrs. Nirupama Sharma, lead. Uh, I just would like to give a brief intro, intro about that. She currently leads the regulatory policy and scientific credibility at Amway. 16 years of extensive experience in regulatory policy, advocacy, capacity building, and stakeholder engagement <coughs> within the food, FMCG, agri sectors. And uh, she, her efforts have been instrumental in formulating effective policy and regulatory recommendations. So she is uh, the regulatory woman that would benefit, <laughs> that would benefit the se sector. Uh, additionally, she has contributed in implementing various awareness and capacity training, capacity building exercises for the industry. Uh, she has a credibility of working for prominent organization, MOFPA, uh, APIDA, uh, FSSI, and uh, the list goes on. She has also held key positions uh, in the industry body, PhD Chamber of Commerce, uh, and uh, the Infant and Young Child Nutrition Council, ASOCHAM. I know her when she was there at ASOCHAM and Crop Life India. She holds a graduate degree, a graduate degree in science and a postgraduate degree in food technology. You see a lot of uh, food technology students also here. And uh, I'm sure that we are uh, waiting for her. But uh, uh, to top of that, she also did MBA in agribusiness. So oh, uh, she's, her topic is innovations in superfood, enhancing nutrition value and consumer health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for such an awesome introduction. 
it could not, not have been better than this. Thank you so much. And I'm really grateful to Invest India, Ministry of Food Processing Industry for offering me this opportunity. It's really a great platform and I congratulate the entire team for organizing such an August session. Thank you. So uh, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, uh, I'll be more uh, formal uh, at this platform. Uh, it's, it's the topic that has been given to me is really interesting. We, we hear a lot of, lot of words like superfoods in the market. So uh, what exactly it is, we'll try to delve upon on this. And uh, for to ease my presentation, I have uh, divided my session into various subtopics so that we can uh, have a you know clear demarcation what how how, uh, what, how it is defined, what is the overview, how it is correlated to the traditional Indian heritage, what kind of products or innovations are happening in the market, what can be the regulatory landscape under which these products can be managed and how we can leverage the abundant potential that India has for superfoods. So here we go. So as the name defined clearly, if we talk of the adjective uh, superlative, it's superfood. That means something above than the basic food, basic nutritional requirement any person can have. So these are basically nutrient dense foods, rich in vitamins, minerals and antioxidants, providing multiple health benefits. As we, as we know the old saying that is food is our medicine. So these, these offer all the nutrients in addition to the basic, basic nutrients that helps in maintenance of our health. Basically addressing the nutritional gaps that we have with our basic diets. They claim to have an edge over the common food, have increased nutritional efficiency and they, have, uh, they, they include uh, health benefits like effective activity of antioxidants and extra amount of bioactive components such, such as anthocyanin, flavonoids, phenolics. I'm sure all the people sitting in the room are aware of these active components and how, how, uh, how and how, uh, when they play the active role in our biochemistry, in the human biochemistry. So nowadays seeing the uh, trend, consumers are really, really uh, attentive to their health and that has led to the importance of the, the category called superfoods. If we see, uh, uh, there are offerings that, um, that are converted into plant proteins, due daily nutritional mixes, plant-based sports nutrition, smoothie mixes, meal replacement rings, nutraceutical, etc. These are composed of superfood ingredients basically. Uh, if you talk of examples, these are basically the general foods which we uh, come to uh, see in our normal lives like berries. Berries uh, have the active components which contribute to heart health, brain function, immune system, leafy vegetables. We are aware from, from our, uh, you know, from our bringing only, our mothers used to tell us, have more green, green leafy vegetables. That's good for our health. Then cruciferous vegetables are linked to anti-inflammatory properties, fish, salmon oil, Omega-3 are good for heart, everyone knows nowadays. Nuts and seeds are good for our health, for sure heart health, for weight loss. Whole grains provide a lot of uh, help in improved digestive system. Legumes are helping, uh, helping in the gut health and immune, immune system. If I would have collected the uh, list of uh, products from Indian heritage, I would have only spoken on those. So I'm trying to, uh, you know, just mention few of the common Indian heritage superfoods that we have on our palate. Turmeric, we are all aware that that are added as a spices. They have a lot of inflammatory properties and help us fight against degenerative diseases like cancer, Alzheimer, etc. Amla, we are all aware it is rich of vitamin C. So it has definitely anti-diarrheal, anti dysentric anti-scorbitic and carminative properties. Moringa, it's basically found in southern region and has a lot of essential amino acids and also it uses anti-hypertensitive, diuretic and, and if we see our basic Indian recipes are containing these ingredients, maybe that time these recipes were designed to include these superfoods so that we have all basic nutrition as well as added nutrition in the form of these superfoods. Ashwagandha, we are all aware, a lot of research is already going on, it is a, taken as a pain reliever, stress reliever, so a lot more. Now coming to the growing market, as we see the consumers are nowadays bent to uh, have a more uh, mindful eating, healthy foods, so the market definitely has a lot of potential and it needs to be leveraged. It is growing fastest at the rate of 20% per annum 
and healthy consumption market segment contributes around US dollar 23 billion to the Indian economy. It can be further increased because there is a lot of global potential. Consumers are aware this is the opportunity. They are more cons conscious about their food choices and seeking healthy <coughs> options. We are aware. Millennials are also looking out for the safe food or sustainable food. And if we saw the plant-based diet, vegan diets, these are the options that many of us are exploring. And uh, they, this has less led to the uh, demand increase. And to address that, industry offerings have happened and consumers seek taste and more sustainable options. So, a lot of uh, work is being done by the researchers and by the industry for food innovation such as plant-based proteins, um, millet, quinoa, ragi flour are available the way nowadays it was not available if we talk of last decade. Because of the awareness, it has increased. At the same time, at the same pace, food processing industry is also changing at a breakneck speed and trying to have more healthy options in their uh, in their uh, portfolio. They are trying to reformulate by adding superfoods in the basic convenience foods also. And to keep changing the demands, definitely companies have to be on toes. So let's see how industry offerings are there in the market. We are all, all aware that in the basic conventional foods, uh, there is a lot of... Uh, lot of offerings like uh, mixed uh, flour, ragi flour is available, then uh, multi millet biscuits are there, uh, multi grain atta is available. So there are a lot of conventional food formats that are available. Then there are uh, other options like um, uh, minimally processed makhana is available as a snacking option, nuts are available as a snacking option. Then we have uh, some uh, protein bars with a lot of superfoods are there in the market. And there are also some advanced food formats like tablet, capsule, which constitute of the super mix mixes of superfoods. Uh, they can be in the tablet capsule format, in the fixed dosage format, so that is more palatable. And then they can be on the uh, powder format, that is easy to consume. Now other practices, in addition to the uh, processed food sector, that is that we talk, spoke of, it's a forward mar market uh, type. And if you talk of the backward linkage, efforts are also uh, uh, happening at the back end wherein the uh, agriculture practices or innovations are happening so that the superfoods uh, potential can be further increased in the crop itself like biofortification it's an effort wherein the value of crops through selective breeding and genetic modification is uh, being uh, attempted to increase their vitamin and mineral content superfoods are being fermented to improve their quality so that they can improve the gut health and nutrient absorption LK and CV uh, there are definitely efforts to in, uh, improve the strain so that we can have more omega-3 fatty acids, protein, antioxidants. Adaptogenic foods are being developed wherein the uh, adaptogens like ashwagandha and maca are uh, adapted to the superfoods to further increase their uh, you know, uh, quality to help uh, release stress, improve mental clarity, etc. Plant-based proteins, we are all aware they are available in the form of uh, powders. Ancient grains are being tapped in the form of multigrain atta, etc., so that they are available to the uh, consumer. Superfood blends are also available, and these mixes are being converted into powder form, tablet capsule form, or added to the conventional food format. Now, talking about the food regulation, as we know, uh, whatever is in the market has to be complied with the regulations, and uh, basically, these are being led by FSS and Nutra regulations, which came in 2022. And uh, uh, it uh, superseded the, the first regulation which came in 2016. Then uh, seeing the International Year of Millets, the others are would really, really be interested to hear this, that FSSA introduced around uh, 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 standards for 15 millets and it got implemented from 1st September 2023, wide uh, food safety and standard, product standards and additives regulations. Then Ayushahar for all the ingredients falling in the category of Ayush, uh, Ayush Ahar takes care of. Then there are a lot of horizontal regulations like labeling and display, advertising and claims and import regulation. All the food, superfoods in the pure form or in the ingredient format, where whichever the final, uh, final product is, they have to comply with these food regulations. Now coming to the end, that's, that's the most interesting part I would like to emphasize on. As we all know that the market uh, uh, market as well as India as a country offers huge tremendous potential to be tapped. 
So effort should be made by the researcher the way it is happening at the back end and of course innovation in the industry, academicians to educate and to do further uh, research, industry and policy maker to leverage this growing opportunity for both domestic as well as international. As we, as we all know, these are our food components. So my strong request and urge would be to treat this as food only. This should never be confused with the medicine. These play a very important role and uh, they, they never, uh, uh, you know, they, there should be no claim that these are treating, mitigating and preventing any disease. So basically these are for addressing the nutritional gaps that we have in our normal diets. Industry, and at the same time, I would say industry should always voluntarily adhere to the code of practice while claiming the product as superfoods with a bit quantification and making claims. That's a huge area that needs further elaboration and uh, more and more work. And then scientific claims, all the claims should be abide by the regulations and advertising claims and should be backed by the uh, clinical studies and scientists and nutritionists. Collaborative efforts are also required for claim substantiation, governance and compliance and quality control and GMP and definitely developed in uh, industries or uh, the higher ups can help and handle the small players as well. Then the second part is consumer and trust. We all industry, researchers, all are working for the end consumer and all of us are consumers here in the room. So there is a need of guideline for influencer marketing. This is must. As we know, a lot of influencers and in create a YouTube without any scientific backing and justification, they target the industry that is not acceptable and they create a lot of mistrust in the consumer in the offerings that are in the market. So there should be uh, some guidelines wherein influencer can abide by and they should have some scientific backing before making anything or before going any anywhere forward in making YouTubes or any any information dissemination. Then I, uh, I we also see that there are prevalence of spurious or counterfeit products which definitely defames the entire industry. There should be a need to check these practices and we all need to be responsible as an industry. Then consumers. As a consumer, uh, I would like all of us to be sensitized enough what to consume, how much to consume, what should be the frequency and it should it should be taken with the balanced diet. Superfoods are answer for sure, they will definitely enhance your health but balanced diet should always be taken along with them. And uh, one, one more uh, myth I would like to, uh, I mean people to understand that suppose one superfood is good in south, it cannot be good in the northern region because all the superfoods and ingredients are basically taken as per the climate. If some crop is um, more in abundance in some climatic region, that may not be good for the other climatic condition. So consumers need to be wary of these and need to be made aware of these. So these are my humble submissions before I conclude. Thank you so much. Thanks for patience here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Especially you have covered almost a 360 degree dimension. I think uh, more of a value chain perspective you have brought in this regard to the superfoods. Uh, in fact, uh, I feel that uh, the issues that are brought out are primarily very important, pertinent to promoting these uh, superfoods uh, and creating a first building up a unique selling proposition for this uh, because uh, they are all uh, very traditional in nature and. Uh, which has a lot of intrinsic value. Uh, it's all important for us uh, how really we build value chain around that. So I think you, your propositions are quite uh, relevant to the technology aspects you have covered, of course, uh, the markets and regulatory aspects, and of course, the awareness, which is very important for building this consumer demand. So I, once again, uh, uh, I'm really just elated to say that this has been a very topic uh, which is being introduced uh, in this August I think audience in an important occasion like this. So I have a uh, uh, few questions which are serious. Uh, uh, what are the biggest challenges that come in superfood sector in realizing potential? You know the potential is uh, quite great and especially the government of India is promoting these superfoods uh, uh, like uh, ancient foods in modern forms. That's very important because if you want to make a significant impact in the global markets, I think 
the forms in which it is being consumed. I think that one of the speaker is going to speak about the delivery system. But uh, in your case, the superfoods, uh, uh, there could be definitely a challenges according to you. What are those uh, uh, biggest challenges to realize this? Thank you, sir. So, biggest challenge, as I mentioned in my last slide, also there should be need. Uh, there is a need of awareness. Um, the uh, superfoods can be used as general food, also like if you see turmeric. Turmeric is being used as a spice. But if I add turmeric everywhere and call it as a superfood, it cannot be. So there are some quantification parameters which industry should abide by that that with correlation with the claim that they make. So that is very important for. Uh, industry to be aware of and we as a responsible industry should always follow and many of the good companies are doing that. It should be backed by some good scientific claims and then definitely uh, awareness amongst consumers should be there. This is the second challenge I would see. So now that, uh, see, uh, what we talk about superfoods are uh, a bit here, a bit there. Right. Uh, so the verticals are very clearly defined for making it a, a commercial because some of them are in a commercial nature, some of them need to be value added further to take to the next level. Right. Some of them, so uh, as we deal with this sector, uh, I think a holistic approach is needed by uh, a great food supply system approach. So, so can you just elaborate uh, how this can be just practically implemented in a country like big in India, big in pan India and to grow? True. So, as, as you see, the lot of potential is there and start right from the uh, backward linkage where the crop is being grown and as, as I mentioned there are a lot of efforts that are being grow, uh, done to enhance the uh, superfood value also. So those awareness amongst the consumer, amongst the farmers is required, right? Who is basically the, uh, producing your raw material. Right from there then the gap practices should be followed and then uh, raw material procurement should be as per the quality parameters. If we keep a control right from uh, the uh, farm only, we'll get the good raw material and their chances of uh, you know, its acceptance in the global market increases as well as domestic market. Then definitely industry has the responsibility of right quantification, making right claims and they are definitely, they are already working a lot of, these are the, the, the formats which are shared are already existing, a lot of innovation <coughs> and research are already being done, what can be the formats, how they can enhance the uh, value, nutrition value which they are offering, that is being done, that should be done. They should definitely establish a code of conduct with regard to quantification which I mentioned, with regard to scientific claims that they are making. Then the policy makers should enhance the ease of doing business the way I mentioned that whatever is food should be taken as food only. There should be no confusion if it is within the ICMR limit it should be considered as food only. Yeah, these are the steps. Actually, actually uh, that's a very important but I think the branding it is yes miss yes very, very I missed that for a part uh, after that um, there, should, there is a lot of requirement for branding and Ministry of Food Processing Industry is doing a lot of work under the umbrella of PLI also, wherein they are promoting the exports. So making it industry inclusive. Yes. So yes. yes. I think uh, it, would be, it would not be appropriate for me to keep on asking questions and not knowing the minds of those people who are listening all the while. So I'll give one, one question uh, to the audience. I think I hope enough, maybe you raise first. Please. So we can help with the mic. You, you raised a very valid point about standardization and making sure that okay, those active ingredients are available. Okay. So, um, when it comes to new superfoods being created, okay, okay. So, myself, James Joseph, I based on ask from Dr. Kalam, I invented a flower or an atta from the unripe jackfruit. Okay. Okay, it's a green jackfruit flower. Okay, that is what I've developed. Um, so, as you being positioned as a food because you are replacing rice or uh, wheat with a vegetable. Okay, it's an unripe fruit. So it is medical nutrition therapy. This is exactly what you're supposed to do for um, uh, diabetes, as per the guidelines. But then the consumer says, unless you tell us why I should have it, there is no change in the taste of the roti or the texture. Okay, so unless you tell me why I should add this, I won't buy it. 
-hmm. So you have to communicate why one should have it. Okay. But when we communicate it, Advertising Standard Council of India stopped us from communicating. Okay. So they asked us to put it through a clinical trial. So we put it through a double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial mm -hmm. to prove that there's an HPA with reduction in 90 days. And then I put the claim, and I fulfilled all the requirements of labeling in India, and I put it on the front of the pack and the back of the pack. The okay. question I have is, after doing that, the industry attacked us. Because we fulfilled all the same the pharma industry attacked us. So it was a significant scan. We survived all of that. So the point I'm saying is that, okay, look, you know, the reason, as you rightly said, we, for, for us, we had to standardize on the soluble fiber and the sugar value. It's a fast ripening fruit. Mm -hmm. So anybody takes jackfruit and powders it, you won't get the same value. So we had to standardize on this. So there's, there's a science which went behind in terms of standardizing the product on the sugar value and the fiber value. So when you invent new, uh, new uh, 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 same thing if you apply to um, millets, if you remove the fiber from millets, the benefit goes away. So how do you make sure that okay, look, when we when we introduce superfoods, the standards are met so that you know um, you get the benefit? So that the role goes into the innovator, if I talk. So that I think a lot of that's why a lot of innovation is being done in the industry only. And uh, whatever claim you have to make, you have to see whether your innovative innovated product has that is actually eligible for that claim. So I would I would request this to be you know taken forward by scientists that like what what scientific methods they can apply that they maintain that quality which you're claiming. No, so I, why for, why does it look like extension that? Extension of her clarification. I think for example, if you're talking about millets, but I think that with authority I can tell that this is the data that an institute was backing about this commodity promotion. So in order to back that, the first, so what we did was the unique selling proposition. Basically, why consumers should have those things at all. While doing so, now there, there was a lot of uh, indiscriminate polishing that is happening where people are, uh, because in the absence of standard rates and standards, people tend to do that. So we went, uh, we plunged into that and we built up a degree of polishing standards. We have come out with it and we published the paper. Now people cannot say that they cannot deviate from the polishing. Now polishing is needed. But uh, what is the extent of polishing? Because without exactly. that uh, fiber alone, then you take it palatable. And if it's not palatable, people will not eat at all. Mm -hmm. So you need to make a common ground wherein the what is the level of polishing and what is that uh, uh, dehelling that has to be taken. And finally, see that your nutrient loss is minimum or the fiber loss is minimum. So once you come out with such literature and that becomes binding for the people to follow up uh, because now the startups are the first ones who take up these things, challenges. And subsequently the industry, once the, uh, uh, you know, the pathway is clutter, uh, clearing the clutter, then the industry also would join the things. Uh, so it's a process. It's a process and I think one has to be just a little patient to emerge these things, but uh, the, its demand dictates uh, the fast tracking of these results. And uh, I think it's not just only the scientist alone, but uh, it is all the stakeholders, their responsibility to take things forward. Thank you. Okay, perfect statement. Demand dictates standards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank uh, you so much. Lord Thank applause. You. Thank you for that. Oh, where is the next speaker? Okay, then we go to the third. Oh. Are you ready, Devish? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, Divij Bajaj is the founder and CEO of the Power Gummies. I think many of the audience I see that I invite him to just come out here, find founder CEO. Uh, Aesthetic Nutrition Private Limited is the company. He is a leading gummy nutraceutical brand in the brand in India. Uh, as you see that he is the youngest among the panelists <laughs> who matches with the audience also. The average age of this audience must be, I think, below 30. So, driven by passion for innovation and commitment to accessible nutrition. So, basically, he was, uh, he is going to talk about a new age nutraceutical delivery solution and boom for the industry. So, the delivery systems, uh, 
are very, very important for solutions that are going to be there. Because for the moment you talk about the neurotransmitical, uh, you know that uh, something in we is set in our minds, and then here he comes with innovation uh, and try to <laughs> provide a solution which is more enjoyable and uh, backed by the science. I think that uh, uh, should uh, credit goes to him, and he also had some accolades. Uh, he was named as the top startup to watch in 2020 by INC442, for, for I don't know what it is, Porto. And he received the Best Innovation Nutrition Product Award from Mini Mint Business. Mint business. So his journey is fueled to desire to create impactful science-driven products that cater to the contemporary lifestyles. He's alumnus of uh, uh, Kirori Mal College, all of you are aware of that, in the University of Delhi, and holds a master's degree in business administration. So now the floor is yours uh, to speak on new age nutraceutical delivery solution, a boom for the industry. A small gentle reminder that you have eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you how nutraceutical is perceived in India and I'll give you my example. So uh, in my school I was taught basis of nutrition but not nutraceutical. For me, for the longest time growing up, nutraceutical was a medicine that doctor prescribes when you're sick or uh, a protein powder that your gym trainer gives you only when you are doing gym. But how do we change that decade long uh, traditional nutraceutical segments that we hear about? What can change and how can India take advantage by understanding what are the changing mechanisms that are delivering in the world and are changing this industry? OTC, preventive care, nutrition, I mean these are words that we have not even heard. I don't think nutraceutical truly is OTC in majority of the world. For us, it is still something that is prescribed. In fact, I never knew what the term OTC means. It is over the counter that I got to know at a very later stage of my life. And hence, this arises the fundamental question as to what can we change in this segment to increase this whole nutraceutical industry. Of course, one way is this, but that's not something that I'm here to recommend today. The way to change it is to understand what people are like, what is their lifestyle habit, and how do we get nutraceutical added in those lifestyle habits. Let me give you a very relevant example that you'll all relate with. 25 years later, 25 years ago, people were not consuming calcium. It was only given to you when doctor used to prescribe. A lot of people never even knew what is the importance of calcium and why it is so relevant. Then, somebody in 2000 thought of converting it into a chewable toffee. So now for everybody, every parent, it was a chewable toffee which is fortified by calcium and it has a lifestyle angle to it, a packaging that we all remember. That's the brand we all had in the childhood. What happened with calcium sandals? It generated the curiosity amongst people to understand what calcium does. It broke the ease of consuming nutrition because with pills you always feel that it's a medicine. Now in a different delivery format, which was chewable toffee, you all felt it's a chewable toffee. Good for kids is fortified by calcium. Hi, I'm Devish Bajaj and I took learning from what I said above. And I thought of doing the same and in that need, I founded a brand that you might have heard of called Power Gummies. In Power Gummies, we deliver nutraceutical in the form of tasty, cute looking gummies. So we solve healthcare solutions in a very easy and tasty way, which is gummies. You have sleep problems, we have a tasty solution for you. We have a tasty gummy that you have and you get the best sleep of your life. You want to reduce your weight, you don't need to have bitter uh, drinks or powders. You can have a tasty sugar free gummy that increases your metabolism and helps you reduce the weight. You want to Reduce your hair fall by 65% and increase hair growth by 22%. We have hair and nail gummies for you. Two gummies a day for 90 days gives you those results. And I agree with Dilupuma ji here that all of these claims that I make here have to be clinically backed. So all the gummies that you hear about power gummies are all clinically backed. We have done clinical trials on all of the products and you can see these published all around in the world renowned journals. Not just this, we plan to launch various other factors Various other, various other form factors in various other nutraceutical needs uh, in the form factor creativities of effervescent tablets, digestive biscuits, protein biscuits, bars, 
uh, herbal I use blends and many more. And that would be the future range. Now why I am focusing so much about our introduction, it's not to market my product here. It's to give you a real life example by a survey that we conducted in the first year of our launch. So in our first year of launch, we understood that 90% of the consumers that bought power gummies were not consuming any of the nutraceutical. A year later, we did a top up on that survey and we understood that they are consuming at least 4 more new nutraceutical products in various other formats and in various other uh, segments solving their problems. What happened? How did that change? So an easy form factor, a new age nutrition brand gave them a gateway to enter into the nutraceutical industry. That made them curious to understand what nutrition does. That made them see the results that broke their barriers and eventually this created adaptiveness. So curiosity, awareness and then adaptiveness. That's the journey that this whole segment is saying. See, with diversified nutraceutical options and products. To give you a better example, uh, and Julia Ji here would you know, advocate that example for me. If today I have to get turmeric to USA, the traditional way is that I get turmeric tablets and deal with that limited market that is there. But how do I grow that market? How do I, create, how do I break that barrier and make this exponentially grow? is by creating turmeric latte, which is a better popular thing in states than even the turmeric tablets. So that, that is what is done by diversified nutraceutical options. You will be surprised to know that um, about from past six years, any nutraceutical study that you see, any nutraceutical chart that you see, you will see that after two years it has changed. So if six years before you read an article that what is the CAGR and how the nutraceutical industry is about to grow in the next two years, two years later when you read an, another article, it will be changed. So you will never find same CAGR, same uh, nutraceutical numbers in all of these articles. A big push has been because of COVID and the other push has been because of the creativity that all entrepreneurs around the world are bringing in the nutraceutical category. And I think that is the future. Currently, as per the numbers, the nutraceutical industry is expected to be $1,250 billion by 2030. But I firmly believe that two years later, this number is going to change to a much larger number because of the creativity happening around the world, which is increasing the whole nutraceutical segment on the whole. And I think this is the sweet spot India has to understand and Indian entrepreneurs have to understand is the key gateway for us to make sure that India wins and makes the payment for leading this whole category worldwide. Jai Hind, thank you. That was a powerful presentation. <laughs> so, fine, I think uh, it all, the product, the personality, the presentation, all have been yeah, of excellent quality. So my, uh, so what, what you brought about this innovative delivery solution is, uh, uh, in fact, uh, other example from, you know, that uh, ice cream and uh, what is that product, uh, latte. Uh, the turmeric, how it can be introduced and brought. Uh, so I think these are all very good examples which uh, one has to see that because ultimately the consumer psych uh, and the delivery system because uh, they should not close their eyes when they take their neurotransmitical proposition and today they can comfortably enjoy those things. Those aspects are of uh, innovative thing and uh, I think uh, power gummies is in the similar lines. Now I have a couple of questions to you. understand that uh, of course this is what do you have any personal connection with the idea of launching this power gummies yeah <laughs> so yeah this uh, power gummies came into existence because of my mom she typically hates to have uh, pills so you can understand it's a big challenge for us to give her any kind of medicine so we used to find creative ways to give her the medicines and imagine when there was nutraceutical need which she had to consume for about three to four months to achieve uh, you know to cure the deficiencies uh, how tedious a task it would have been for us. 
and that enlightened me that uh, why can't nutrition be fun? Why it has to be delivered in the traditional manner? Why can't we break the barriers and make it enjoyable? I think that is what led to discovery of Bhava uh, That's the personal story. Wonderful, wonderful. So taking you to another question, uh, how do you think Ayurveda and India can lead a, a nutraceutical segment worldwide? So I believe that there is strength and there is a brand value that has been created in all of these cuts. Um, like if I have to consume almonds, California almonds, you know, there's a branding which is the California almonds. Now if I have to buy a machinery, there's a brand name that you know German machineries are the best, so that's what I go to see. Similarly, India has two Brahmastras with us and that is what we uh, entrepreneurs have to understand that in worldwide, as a brand value, two things, one is millet, which of course are your leading, and the other one is Ayurveda. Both of the things, you know, worldwide has a brand value attached with India. If you have three countries competing and a millet based product is made in India or Ayurvedic product is made in India, everybody in the world would prefer taking made in India because that's the brand value that has been created. And that everybody understands that these are the strengths India possesses. And if you are not able to utilize that and you know create and dent the market space, then um, I think we we'll lose on a very big opportunity. But I'll make sure that me and all the other Indian entrepreneurs do, don't miss that opportunity. <laughs> I am sure that the new startup ecosystem that is uh, being encouraged by the government of India yes. and uh, I think there is going global, I think uh, there is uh, of course long way to go but still I think we are on the track and uh, we will be able to make dent in this sale. Now uh, I uh, invite one question, oh, please introduce yourself, be brief, uh, just yes. to the question. Yeah, hi, I am Ashwin from Hyderabad. Ashwin. Uh, I come from IT background, but right? it is comforting for me to know that you are an MBA guy and not a food technologist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I was looking for a food processing opportunity. I, I absolutely I have no idea of what is food processing. I thought I will have some information here. So my only question is: the existing ecosystem can help someone from out of the industry to start something in nutraceuticals. Is it possible? Of course, it is possible. Uh, this is the same fear I had because I come from a marketing background. I am not from the food technology background. Uh, but the way India is paving way worldwide, you will be surprised to know that we do more business in UK than India. An Indian brand is doing more business in nutraceutical industry in UK. We are number 3 trending in TikTok in UK. Number 5 trending on Amazon in uh, Dubai. So uh, that's the kind of opportunity India has because the whole ecosystem, the whole world is eyeing and thanks to the Indian government that an euphoria has been created worldwide where you know everybody is looking to India as an opportunity. So the moment, of course, for us we we'll need assistance from a lot of food technologies to create the product and we have a lot of uh, senior food technologists on panel as well. Initially I took guidance from a lot of research institutes. Um, if you want to get into Millet Base, sir and his team is always there, they have great innovations and they are looking for people like us to take these innovations to work. Uh, similarly, there are other research institutes, so you can understand, uh, you can take help of them and uh, get into the field and eventually you can hire you know, food technologies and eventually I think uh, you learn once you enter the industry. But how long did it take uh, to create a product, one single product? First product, it took me about two and a half years. But follow on products, I think we create the tag to uh, NPD is about two months. Initial investment? Initial investment that I did was about 25 lakh and then I raised round. So the good thing is that the ecosystem is looking for people to invest on. In India now, the investment in startup has also increased to multifolds. I know there was a setback last year with a little bit of uh, you know funding winter happening around India. But otherwise, the whole world, I think we're number three in terms of receiving FDIs. So the whole world is looking uh, to invest in India. That's what the team here promotes from Invest India. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Devich. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, a lot of applause, I think. Uh, uh, the <laughs> yeah, Sean, uh, way forward for the delivery systems. No, I just uh, call upon uh, Ms. Julie Adams, uh, Vice President, Global Technology, Technical and Regulatory Affairs, Armand Board of California. I see, uh, 
She is currently the Vice President of Global Technical and Regulatory Affairs of Army Board California since 2000. So, has a very uh, elaborate experience and responsible development strategy to address the international trade policy, technical issues on food safety, access, regulatory changes, and other factors that influence the global shipment of the California and uh, uh, two decades of this experience has played a significant role in global supply chain initiatives through Codex initiatives. But after coming here, I just came to know that uh, the major uh, importers of the California uh, are India. So I just want to know that do really India name California Alberts? I think from there you can start your presentation. Exactly. Thank you, sir. It is an honor to be here, and it's, it's interesting as we talk about California and almonds and with this discussion, it's really quite relevant, but it's, it's interesting as you think about the fact that India and almonds are actually completely aligned and integrated, and so that's why it's so interesting to be here to, to speak. What's surprising, I think, to many is that most of the almonds that have been consumed in India are produced in California. We're producing about 80% of global production, and India is the largest export market. And what's amazing is because almonds, as we talk about superfoods, as we talk about nutraceuticals and innovation, almonds are a, a food that has actually been intrinsic in the Indian culture and diet for centuries. And what's interesting now is looking at the innovation and new opportunities to look at integrating that culture and that tradition in new products as we go forward. And that's where for the Almond Board and the activities we've been involved in, we've actually been investing in research for decades. And most of that started years ago looking at heart health. And certainly as we heard earlier about nuts and seeds as superfoods, the idea of almonds and heart health I think has been well accepted, but we wanted to do the research to be able to confirm and verify the traditions and the views. So as we started with, with heart health, research started to evolve, and we started looking at the other properties of, of almonds. So looking at gut health, weight management, satiety, these are all areas I think that are important to consumers, and we were finding that the science is there to justify the claims and the views on how these foods can be used. What's amazing is in India, where much of our research has been underway, diabetes, blood sugar regulation, has been a key focus. And what we've actually seen from the research is that the effects in India in an Indian diet are even better with consumption of almonds than we see in a number of other countries. So this is an area that we're really trying to do more work and also to take a more holistic approach. As we talk about Ayushahar, the idea of looking at food as part of this broader tradition and culture, what we've actually done is to study some of the ancient texts and look at where almonds actually are part of the recommendations that go back centuries. And in much of this, it was using almonds as part of different food preparations for different beneficial effects. But what we have found by doing the research and the science is we've been able to connect what your mothers told you years ago as you were growing up is actually based in science. And that is a very strong proposition as we go forward. So in joining the panel today, and as we started looking at all of the different ways that a food like almonds can be involved, what we see is research is just the starting point. And as you heard, we have to be able to substantiate what it is we're saying. We feel we can do that now. But what's important is it's really going to be innovation that drives trends. So whether it is looking at incorporating maybe an, an almond flour into power gummies, maybe in the future. The idea is that we have to ensure that we are taking an approach that meets what consumer needs are, and it meets consumers where they are at that time in their lives. So as
as we look beyond the research on nutrition and health, then if you're really looking at food processing and innovation, how do we expand our functional understanding of the way to use almonds? So if it's a matter of incorporating almond flour with millet flour to be able to deliver a smoothie or in a biscuit, what is that substitution rate? What are the factors that almond flour brings? How do you use that in a way that's going to deliver the nutritional benefits that are the reason to incorporate almonds, but do it in a way that meets the ultimate need of that product? So we've now been exploring more on shelf life, on packaging, on roasting characteristics, to really see how we can maximize the way almonds are being utilized and we're doing this closely in conjunction with food processors. And, and I will say it's quite exciting discussions we've had with Ministry of Food Processing in looking at ways we can help support industry, help support the commercial enterprises here in India to use these ingredients to their advantage. And I would say, too, we can't forget the whole issue of sustainability and waste. This is a concern everywhere. And what we're actually seeing in terms of some new products in some other markets is companies who are actually taking the in-shell almond, grinding the whole thing, and then using that in a food application. And in fact, that's bringing additional fiber, uh, additional sugars to that product. So I think what we are learning, and for all of us as part of this panel, is to recognize that there are no limits to the innovation. And I think the thing that we have to be sure we don't fall into is a trap of thinking what we know today is going to be the best way to face tomorrow. And so those are some of the areas where we've looked at the fact that you take tradition, you look at the functional benefits, you look at the research, but then you start charting that unique path. So whether it's gluten-free, lactose-free, you're looking for sustainable needs, you're looking for shelf life or plant-based. What we have to, I think, all recognize as we go forward is that consumers are looking for more than just taste in their food. They want it to also help them to, whether it's look better because of skin health or feel better because of heart health, diabetes, sugar reduction, but that has to be part of the overall approach to food. And so for, for us, as we look at the way we work together in various markets, we're trying to take that approach, which is to be very holistic and look at the needs from production in the orchard all the way to the consumer channel and meet consumers where they are with the demands they have at that time. So with that, I will stop. And again, thank you very much for letting me be part of this panel and look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, coming all the way from the United States for this program and enlightening us about the California almonds and their importance and the emerging needs, especially with the body of evidence, uh, uh, the goodness of uh, almonds, especially that of our gut health, for some heart health to gut health. Gut health is, uh, I think, is the most emerging thing. It could be the markets that revolve around the gut health uh, are going to be game changer. So I think uh, these traditional foods, uh, or including uh, almonds, uh, they have very intrinsic value in really just resolving that uh, either in the terms of probiotics, prebiotics, and through the starch, uh, some, in case of millets, of course, uh, there can be prebiotics, probiotics. So, a lot of uh, markets that are emerging, I think, how you position the product and then take the advantage of it and bring goodness of uh, those products to the human health. That's uh, the ultimate key, that, uh, what is, that is what is emerging and uh, Largely popular state uh, country like India has a lot of relevance with regard to the health. In terms of you know, just uh, yesterday, yesterday years, we were talking about lifestyle issues and all those things, but now it is all uh, uh, dynamics around the gut health. So, 
Uh, well, well presented and uh, I appreciate uh, you have brought out the food safety quality related issues, especially the challenges of um, posed by, uh, in fact, uh, some of the things that are involving this thing. And I appreciate your presentation, but then I have a couple of questions. Because the evolution uh, which you highlighted a uh, uh, crucial role in making contemporary diets as well as their adaptability to the modern diets. This shift uh, is a very key thing that uh, we may find it in a, every commodity. But uh, that could be a shadow thing for us, but uh, we are dealing with in a general global nutrition and safety thing. So taking that context anyway, plant-based proteins are the key focus of this uh, World Food India conference. How do you envision the new West thing, uh, almonds being incorporated into the space? Because we talk uh, these days about the milk, uh, non-dairy based milk, uh, almond milk and other things that are coming up, the new markets that are emerging. And what is their potential in India? I, I think the, the potential here is actually, uh, I would say, among the, the best globally. Because what we're seeing is there is such a demand for plant-based foods, whether it's vegetarian or vegan, or because of uh, a lactose intolerance or, or gluten-free. I think what we're seeing is a plant-based approach is, is very prominent. The traditional morning consumption is still foundational to the way almonds are being consumed. But I think the opportunity is to look beyond that and see how you can start incorporating the flour or the oil into other forms. And that's where I would say the, the greatest opportunity here is in that uh, plant-based focus is looking at including foods like nuts and seeds in some of those preparations and really looking at, I would say, maximizing the nutritional benefit that you get from combining foods rather than maybe just looking at one ingredient. And I think that's where uh, the opportunity here is, is that we may not think about turmeric in, in the States, but then when you start to look at how that can augment another plant-based food, I think that's where we see tremendous opportunity here in India. What is the quality of the protein that, because uh, when we talk about plant-based proteins and the last thing, quality of the protein compared to these other commodities that are targeted like green protein? Um, almonds have... Uh, in terms of amino acids. In terms of? Amino acids. Amino acid composition. Amino acids. Um, almonds um, have many of the essential amino acids. It's not considered a complete protein. I think there are very few nuts and seeds, maybe only one that can actually be, be viewed as a complete protein. But we see a very high proportion of, of protein, fiber, uh, vitamin E in almonds. So I think that's where they can contribute to that, to that need. I think you well said because most of the plant-based proteins, we know that all the essential amino acids are not present. Mm -hmm. So it's in going in combination with those things, complement with each other and make a perfect uh, quality to protein, that is what the way forward. So, you offer millets, uh, it has uh, most of the amino acids. Anyway, the last question to you is, given that most almonds in India are imported, how does this support the country's food processing sector? I, I think this is actually a very important uh, area to, to consider because there is such uh, an important view as far as make in India and looking at local products, and I think that is very key. What we find is the almonds that are being exported to, to India, it's all being processed in India. So almonds are coming in in their whole form. You see the, the flour, the oil, slicing, flavoring, all happening in India. So actually the value addition is happening here, and a lot of the innovation is happening here. So I think we see this as a very um, synergistic relationship because, well, Mother Nature may not uh, provide all of the, the environment for growing almonds in India. We see that in California there's been a long-standing relationship. So many Indian families are, are in California, many own orchards, 
and they're exporting to, to families here. So we see it as a very community-based approach, and I think this is where we see the, the growth and um, success in India will be the growth and success of our growers as well. Wonderful. So growing in California, making in India. So <laughs> somehow you have brought in the connection between these two things. Uh, now, one question from this side. Uh, Please, please raise your hand. How much, uh, how much quantity of almond a person can eat in per day? I, I think he raised his hand. Just uh, please. please. Yes, my basic question is that, uh, are we seeing that, you know, that these uh, superfoods like almonds can go, become inferior, you know, because they, because once the demand rises, you know, you will find that the quality is compromised. We, we saw that, you know, uh, that they, chemicals will be used for that, the water will be used and the, there will be a lot of, you know, we, uh, they will become main course like, you know, uh, rice and wheat, you know, and uh, they won't be able to give that kind of benefits, you know, as far as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, because we are already seeing in the market, you know, elements basically, even on inferior quality are being marketed by uh, the, I mean, uh, by the retailers, you know, and uh, they basically uh, are uh, so much of different varying points and people are using it uh, at uh, quite a fast pace, but they are not able to, I mean, uh, uh, do the benefits, you know, like, uh, for example, we even saw with the apple, you know, with the oranges also, they are being produced, and, but uh, in fact, they are with the added sugar, added fat, you know, and uh, in the long term, they might not be able to sustain that kind of benefit, you know, so how do you see that, you know, how, do, how can we man man uh, manage the quality, you know, these, well, I think one of, the, one of the benefits of the production in California is there are very strict requirements. And so everything is, is controlled. All of the almonds that are produced have to go through the same standards and, and review. And this is where growing in California, I think, sometimes drives our growers crazy because of all of the, the, the requirements on them. But it also gives that level of confidence to customers. I think what we are seeing is that with the standards that are being put in place, and as you were hearing earlier with the requirements of FSSAI, with Ministry of Ayush, et cetera, there are standards that <coughs> foods have to comply with. And so I think as we start seeing more products come in, it will be important that the regulatory framework keep up with the products that are being introduced and that we continue to rely on that to ensure that consumers are getting exactly what it is they believe they are getting, which is a, a wholesome, healthy food. And that's something, certainly from the California side, we would want to ensure the raw material meets those expectations. And then working with companies here to see that that continues as it moves into the consumer channel. Thank you very much, Lydia and Chris. Uh, so please join your hands to uh, That brings us to the last panelist, uh, Mr. Amit Agarwal, CEO, Artisan Private Limited. Uh, he is a director of Natural Remedies Private Limited. Uh, he is a CEO and serves uh, as well as director. 30 years of experience in herbal research and development, and uh, is an active member in several prestigious committees, uh, especially. Uh, Crude Drugs Committee of Indian Pharmacopoeia Commission, the Department of Biotechnology, uh, Task Force on Medicinal Plants, he is a screening committee member of National Medical Medicinal Plant Board, and he has several other accolades uh, with a rich experience. He comes with a background uh, of Masters in Pharmacology with a specialization in plant medicines from University of uh, Strathclyde, UK. So, uh, now uh, uh, he has also pursued PhD in pharmacology. So, uh, with that background and several publications, patents, uh, so he comes with a, a embodied personality to make a presentation. I, I request him to come forward. Uh, he is going to um, speak on uh, botanical foods and pathogens. Uh, pathogens. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I do not have a formal presentation. I just thought I would tell a little brief about myself and then come to the point of what I'm trying to say. Uh, I come from a company called Natural Remedies, which makes uh, botanical powders, uh, extracts, uh, and also some formulations which are for animal health care. Uh, majority of the uh, export uh, that we do is uh, to US. 
and uh, that is our botanical extracts. Uh, <coughs> the point I wanted to bring was that for most of the foods that we talked about, whether it is superfoods or Ayush Ahar or nutraceuticals, the regulation requires that they comply to a specific microbial count. So, uh, <coughs> um, <coughs> when I export uh, some of my botanical ingredients, uh, particularly to the um, Californian side of uh, US, and there is a regulation there called Californian Prop 65. And uh, <coughs> most of my buyers uh, expect that the microbe reduction process that I follow should have been validated. And how that validation is done is by doing a challenge test that whatever botanical material that you are making, even if it's a jackfruit flower or uh, you know whatever natural ingredient, superfood or Ayurvedic ingredient, it is intentionally mixed with a surrogate of salmonella to a high degree, maybe 10 raised 7, 10 raised 8, and then you do your uh, microbe reduction process and then you show that there is a minimum 5 log reduction. Now, as most of you know with botanicals, uh, many of the botanicals are heat sensitive. If you give it too much of heat, uh, it undergoes changes. So with natural products, we find that change is not just in the color order taste fracture, that is the organoleptic profile. There is also a change in the nutritional profile. There is a change in phytochemical profile. So the, the TLC patterns, uh, the identification tests that are recommended for most herbs, uh, based on a technique called thin layer chromatography, we call it TLC. Uh, these change completely. Um, <clears throat> so the while the regulation requires that uh, microbe reduction processes be demonstrated to show a minimum five log reduction, uh, but in in reality, I mean, we find that we are destroying the properties of our superfoods. Um, <clears throat> what I've been sort of struggling with is, obviously there is no compromise on food safety, so if the regulator <laughs> believe that five log reduction is essential, then so be it. But the question is, can that five log be achieved in maybe two or three steps? If I just take the example of almonds itself, let's say I've imported almonds from California and they are unprocessed yet, and if I decide, okay, I'm going to wash them up thoroughly, maybe there is a one log or half log reduction because of that washing step, and I'm going to dry them using an infrared dryer, which is a specialized dryer, which can reduce, uh, again, maybe one or two logs. And then finally, I would do steam sterilization. But need not be 121 degrees for 15 minutes, which is the autoclaving temperature. <coughs> so when we talk about operating should I say sub uh, autoclaving conditions, maybe 100 degrees for a shorter duration of time, then uh, whether that is regulatory wise acceptable. Because what we've seen is many of the herbs, they completely change their profile. Even the identity test would not pass. And I know this because I've had the pleasure of, uh, privilege of working with many pharmacopias. The Ayurvedic Pharmacopia Committee or the uh, Indian Pharmacopoeia Commission and even the United States Pharmacopoeia, most of the standard setting bodies would lay down standards for an unsterilized product. But when it comes to industry, industry cannot offer an unsterilized product for export. So there is an inherent uh, gap between uh, you know, what the, where the standards are laid down and what the law requires the industry to practice. So, uh, for experts like uh, Nirupomaji, since you serve uh, several committees of MOFP and SSAI, maybe this is a point uh, to be clarified for the benefit of all the industry. Can the five log reduction be achieved in increments? You know, can, can we do before it's sent out, we will demonstrate that there is a five log plus reduction, but it need not come from a single harsh step. If I'm doing dry heat treatment, I will need to heat the botanical to a very large uh, temperature, which would take a toll on its quality, on its functionality. 
Same is with steam sterilization. Off late, there have been innovations which uh, talk of high temperature but short time. But even there, we have seen with experience delicate herbs like Rotukola, we call it uh, Centella or Mandukpani in uh, Sanskrit. It completely changes, I and mean, you can no longer identify the, the profile of that material. So there is a need uh, to maybe bring in some policy uh, which takes care of uh, these ground realities. I'm also uh, <coughs> been searching for many years uh, regulatory guidelines for what we call as VBNC. So whenever we operate sub-optimal sterilization treatments, let's say we're not doing 121 degrees for 15 minutes, which is a 100% kill step for most pathogens, if we are operating at a lower temperature, at a, for a shorter time, or it's the temperature which kills, so generally lower temperatures is what people use, then is there apprehension of inducing the VBNC state? Now, as I have read a little, VBNCs are viable but not conservable organisms, so <coughs> you could have a batch where you think you test it in, you know, with all the earnestness and all the thoroughness, you test it and you pass it, but by the time it goes to US uh, by sea, you find uh, maybe one colony of salmon that comes up, and one is bad enough for a entire container to be rejected. And uh, <coughs> so earlier, you know, most of you know about this bird, Phoenix, uh, they say it grows from ashes, and I think there is a connect, I'm not a microbiologist, but my friends tell me that from a completely constant batch, yet sometimes there have been occasions that a, a pathogen has sprung to life, and how a pathogen can spring to life if it was absolutely killed at one time is probably linked to the induction of VBNC states which are viable but not culturable. So what we have to understand is when we do suboptimal heat treatments, we injure the microbes, particularly the pathogens, to such an extent that they can no longer be cultured. And all the testing that we do is based on culture. If it does not show up on culture, we would say no growth. But actually, the microbe is still there. It's just that it is injured. And because it's injured, it cannot, it will not show up in the culture. And uh, so there's a paucity of uh, methods. Uh, I go keep going lab to lab as to do you have a test for VBNCs? Because I know I'm intentionally doing suboptimal heat treatment. I want to be sure that no container ever comes back, or if, or or there is a threat to food safety. But then I find that. There are very few labs in our country which would test for VBNCs and neither is there enough scientific literature. So if there is a body within MOFPI which is promoting research, then this is one field or uh, neglected area which requires attention. And um, so not to take more time, so this is all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Amit, uh, for uh, throwing some light about the challenges posed by emerging microbial detection issues which are very important and uh, emphasizing the importance of balance, food safety, the preservation of natural food characters by addressing the challenges posed by emerging microbial detection issues in botanical foods. So, uh, going forward, uh, so I think uh, uh, we would like to have What are the suggestions uh, you may provide for the to the regulatory frame, policy framework with regard to microbial reduction process for elimination of chances of reducing VBNCs? Um, actually, that was my question where I don't know the answer, so I thought like maybe somebody in the audience would answer that. But no, what I would recommend is panelists can also just uh, and if I just mention. Um, the Almond Board of California also recommends a five log reduction. Different but what is not clear is whether that five log has to come from a single step or can it come as a sum total of maybe two or three steps. Yes. Start. 
Yes, for, for almonds in California, we actually have a minimum four log reduction requirement, and that was based on conducting a risk assessment to be able to, to demonstrate that that was sufficient to kill the, the pathogen of, of concern. So there is a minimum four log. There's nothing to preclude use of um, hurdle technology, so this idea of multiple steps. Uh, I think the, the concern is just being able to demonstrate that uh, you do have the cumulative effect and that after each step, you don't have the, the regrowth of the pathogen, as you were mentioning, and that there are adequate controls in place. So I think that's where the challenge comes of a, a hurdle technology. But there's, there's nothing to preclude it. It's just being able to do the, the validation to demonstrate the efficacy. Just to add to your points, uh, these points I think we can take up and we can request FSSI if that can be delivered on and discussed if that can be you know talked of. Thank you. I think FSSI is uh, just evolving, uh, especially getting into the botanical foods. Uh, they have a serious uh, job before them actually. There are several challenges that are there. I think. I think it has to be represented. Uh, In fact, just to apprise a uh, group and the masses here, there was a lot of discussion that happened in the month of uh, April, May, wherein the botanical testing methodologies were discussed and they, they were found that there are some gaps and they are working on it. So it will be a good idea to, I uh, will connect with you after this and we can take it forward. I, I, I think uh, you have published this data. Any publications are coming up. That's very important, the dates. Uh, FSSI to take it uh, on a fast track in more. So, one question, one last question. When we are importing almonds from California, we are on the contract say that this is unpasteurized. So, would that be a pasteurization would give us a log 5 reduction or log 4 as you say for the California almonds? Is that, is that the is that the uh, procedure for getting it in the log four? Uh, it, would be sorry. it would be a, a commercial uh, request if you wanted to purchase pasteurized product, and then it would normally be a minimum four log reduction. We have a facility who's uh, doing it in India. There's a guy who's doing a UV infrared uh, pasteurization technique down in South India. So I was just uh, looking at it. Would that mean that uh, there would be no growth of micro? Low because we gave a shelf life of 12 months or beyond that. Would that mean that the kind of tropical climate here in India, would that suffice? I, I would suggest let's take this up maybe after the panel because I'm not a microbiologist either. Uh, we do have uh, process authorities and so we would be able to, to put you in touch with that information I think afterwards. Yeah, there's another, another query on that. I, I think, think uh, this, this she, she has already said that yeah, you know, she's going to meet you after. Yeah, that. there's one thing more. That's uh, a myth in India, like when we are just processing almonds. <laughs> when we are processing almonds, there are scratch marks, which are edible in case of USG specs. But in India, there's a myth that when there are scratch marks, it's just a skin being peeled off. It's been taken as that the oil has been taken off, which is not possible. And that is taken as a reject by the Indian consumer. So that's a myth that has been coming up till date. And we, there are many processes in India which are just commercially uh, removing that by in uh, ethical practices just to hide that scratch mark. So I think you can just take this answer. And you know, he knows uh, because we are lacking time. Please, uh, after that, you can just verify his uh, Thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening session. In fact, uh, uh, I hope you are here, the session coordinator. I think hope we are on time for clicking that. Uh, and a lot of insights are brought in uh, to really just uh, our kudos to the various speakers uh, and the panelists. And the, the thank you for your excellent presentations as well as uh, uh, the way you answered the questions, I think it has not, but I think all the answers cannot be addressed in a session which is bored by the time. So, 
we have a time you know thank you so time. much for a wonderful moderation i i think lot of uh, applause goes to you yeah. thank you thank you so much so the last thing i just want to tell you is that uh, i see lot of young people uh, future entrepreneurs uh, we run a business uh, incubator technology business incubator we provide uh, so financial facilitation apart from the technological technology is backstopping so you are you are most welcome to come and be in contact with nutri hub indian institute of millet research based in hyderabad thank you once again